uh, with plans, initiatives, uh, working with Dr. Taur Rahman and uh, team and leading uh, the higher education sector in the country. And I think uh, it's not wrong to say, I mean, that was the golden period because we could not sustain uh, that kind of continuity of uh, prosperity for the higher education sector uh, in terms of development, infrastructure, research. But now we are actually uh, getting the benefits of all that plans and uh, projects that were initiated uh, in terms of uh, research output, expansion and development in the higher education sector in public and private institutions. And uh, certainly it's a great honor for all of us uh, to listen to him. Uh, he's currently the Vice Chancellor of National uh, University of Central Asia. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, it's an international new assignment and uh, would like to hear from him uh, in the new normal, uh, what are the challenges and what are the uh, constraints and uh, what is the way forward. Uh, and and uh, certainly higher education sector uh, in this uh, uh, area of uh, digital uh, revolution and disruptive technologies uh, uh, with focus on innovation. Uh, let's hear docs up uh, uh, and it will be certainly a big learning experience, I'm sure for all of us. Thank you very much. And over to Dr. Suhail Lakhvi, please. Bismillah uh rahim Thank you, uh, Fazal. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Mukhtar. Uh, always a great pleasure to have the opportunity to, to see and interact with colleagues. Uh, with Fazal, of course, who we were fellow deans uh, in uh, GIK uh, Institute, which was the first uh, university I came back to uh, from uh, the US. So today, um, in going with the times, uh, we are going to be discussing higher education, during and post COVID-19 uh, opportunities and challenges. So the way I've uh, structured this talk is to talk about COVID-19 first. I would like to unpack, uh, if you may, uh, this disease, what its impact has been, and then perhaps look at it a little more uh, deeply. What does it have to teach uh, us here. And then move to higher education. How is it that we are practicing higher education um, at this time in uh, Pakistan? And uh, then combine these two. What does COVID teach us and tell us and how do we apply it to uh, higher education? And that is where I feel the opportunities uh, come in. The challenges themselves are, they, they are manifested uh, in all the work that we have been doing and you are all very well aware of that. And then after uh, putting uh, this together, the question would be, well, what is it that we as individuals uh, can do, who may be uh, a student, a, a researcher, a faculty member, a academic administrator, vice chancellor, uh, regulator uh, at, at the provincial or national level. How does all of this apply uh, to us? So that is the uh, structure of the talk and let's see uh, how it goes. Now we focus on uh, COVID-19 uh, to uh, start with. I am not uh, a scientist or biologist, so I am not going to go into the pro protein uh, uh, structures and the spiky nature uh, of that. We've all seen uh, the pictures which are gruesome enough. But what this disease did is something that um, all of us uh, who are uh, in the in the world today had never seen uh, before that this was this one thing that impacted the entire world every single country of uh, the world every single region every um, town village uh, uh, entity it blanketed the entire world this was this is something that certainly the world had not 
uh, scene. And it brought the world to its knees. It, it let you know who is in charge and what uh, is in charge over here. And there was nobody who was escaping the wrath of this uh, pandemic that let loose across uh, the world. It stopped local travel. It stopped international travel. It put a break into all human interaction. Going out of the house became an exercise in which we are you know, looking at, should we go, should we not go, put a mask on, where do we go? Uh, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, where I am at this time, there was a curfew imposed. You were not allowed to go outside. There was army patrol on the on the streets. If there was an, if there was uh, allowance for very specific reasons to go out, and you had to carry evidence uh, of that. So this was no joke, and this is not just an isolated example. It happened across this entire uh, world, all the way in which we lived in which we worked, in which we studied, in which we researched, it impacted anything and everything. It shuttered uh, businesses, organizations, universities, schools, everything came uh, to uh, a standstill. And it created a massive scientific challenge. Where in the world did this come from? The theories that were raised about, you know, bats, the bats, uh, 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 they being stressed, and because of stress causing a mutation uh, in the virus, which then jumped to a pangolin, supposedly. These are these are theories. The conclusive proofs of these things have not come across, and then they went into. Uh, something that the humans uh, uh, contracted and that resulted in this thing. Why did it spread so easily? Well, that they finally uh, figured out, but all of us know the time period in which we were talking about, well, okay, mask, how effective is it, air supply, the longevity of that, the temperature it, it survives. They, it, it created massive scientific excitement also because you had a new thing that you, that you uh, worked on. And it raised the fear factor. So when, it, when you got a new virus and it interacted with the computers in terms of, it created essentially a biological computer virus because the spread of information, the spread of fear, the spread of uh, uh, false news, real news, uh, good news, bad news was at such an astronomical pace that it took over uh, the world. But then there were all kinds of anomalies that appeared. Why uh, was it impacting different countries in such a different way? It didn't impact everybody the same way. Why did it impact uh, children so differently? In fact, after a while, they said, well, op open uh, the schools, the children are, are, are different, uh, age groups are different. And they say, well, okay, after 30, it, it, it interacts uh, uh, more. Questions and upon questions upon questions that piqued the interest of all the biologists, and uh, I'm sure Dr. Mukhtar uh, was in his element studying it, looking at it, and all the virologists and biologists uh, were delighted to have this opportunity to wrestle with the real world uh, uh, problem. And all of this occurred as we in the world were priding ourselves that we have sort of, you know, conquered science. We know everything. We have we have gotten to the bottom. We know all the uh, all the, the past and 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 the future. And here was this tiny invisible virus that, as I have mentioned before, brought the world to its entire to entire world uh, to its knees. Then, as we progressed through it. Uh, this disease, then the question kept being asked, how soon before we go back uh, to this pre-COVID world? 
So we said, well, I mean, this this is a disruption that is occurring, and and, and when we figure it out, we'll figure it out. We will we will sort it out, and we'll go back uh, to the world that we are used to. And we are being given promises, and there is definitely hope because we have the uh, uh, the vaccines that have been uh, developed. And then there is also all of these additional mutations that are occurring and constant daily questions, does this work, does this not work, what works where, and so on. So what is it that we currently know about this virus? And I am taking here material uh, from an article that appeared this month in the New Yorker uh, magazine, a very uh, detailed article. And it said, yes, the death rates of COVID-19 are very, very different across the world. The death rate in Bangladesh is 3.5% on a per capita basis to what it is in the US. US has half a million deaths. So if you were, I mean, uh, looking at the populations and let's say that there is a, a two to one difference, you would expect 250,000 uh, people uh, having died in Bangladesh, the fact is it would be 3.5%. There's not a small amount of difference that one can you know, say, okay, this is measurement error. Pakistan was predicted to have 650,000 deaths. Pakistan has in reality on the order of 12,000 deaths. Do we know why? The death rate is so different. Do we know why children are generally spared? The answer to this question is actually no. All the worst researchers of the world work with seven plus billion people and we do not have a simple answer. We don't know why Pakistan is in this situation where they are talking about now opening up everything and an entire developed world is shuttered down and in its uh, curfew position uh, almost. And we don't know when the world will come back to pre-code. To, to, to pre so what, does that, what, what lesson is there uh, for us? What does it teach us? What it is saying uh, to us is just a reminder that this scientific knowledge that we have, okay, in the, let us be realistic about what is the extent of this knowledge. Do we know a lot or do we know a little about, about the world? I don't think there is an answer to that. What we do know is that for every door that we open, there are a thousand doors that appear behind that way that we never even knew existed. We think we have figured out the structure of the atom and then we go on and we find, you know, look at proofs of the Higgs boson and then we look into that and yet in another vast world appears. The same is true about human systems and understanding uh, uh, how they're working. The, the progress of knowledge is the progress of the understanding of our own ignorance. That is possibly the way uh, we can put uh, that and and COVID nineteen has definitely demonstrated um, that in an ample uh, manner. And we do not know everything. We don't don't even can't even define what everything is. So as far as the extent of knowledge that we know, it's like traveling from here to Islamabad, from Lahore to Islamabad, or any place. To, you you can go on Google and you'll find out how many kilometers there are. Well, in this case, our destination we don't know how far it is. We just get these glimpses that tell us that our knowledge is very, very little. Now, let me stop here about COVID-19 and completely switch to another topic, which is higher education in, in Pakistan. Higher education in Pakistan has spread to the various corners of the country, uh, but we primarily are uh, still practicing a teacher classroom physical interaction, physical transfer of knowledge information model. Example of virtual university notwithstanding and some examples of distance uh, education uh, being practiced. There are 
projects that are undertaken in which we are looking at integrating uh, knowledge and we are combining the theoretical and the practical or the knowledge and the skills to have an understanding. There is some aspect of that which is integrated. We are still primarily focused on uh, degrees which we define through courses that are focusing on the knowledge aspect and there is some small attention to the skills domain. When we talk about higher education, we are primarily concentrating in Pakistan on the word universities. So that university is that environment. It's a physical environment in which higher education trade occurs in the sense that there is teaching and there is learning and there is pushing the boundaries of knowledge within the domain of a physical entity that we call a uh, university. Our examinations are face to face. We are, in some manner, we need to have proof that the person out there is actually doing uh, that work for which we are testing them. And we have a mechanism of a test that we have defined to determine and assess whether knowledge is there um, or not. Our quality assessment is primarily still through a review of what I call input processes. What, does go, what goes in? How many lectures we have? What is the curriculum that we have? Who is teaching the curriculum? What is the methodology? And we're also looking at the process. And just like this talk, all of our higher education, almost in its entirety, is in English. The reading of it, the writing of it, the speaking of it, uh, the language that we are focusing on is English. That is the structure of the higher education system that we have in, uh, in Pakistan. Very, uh, very much structured, uh, rule-based. Uh, uh, there are systems for quality assurance, etc. And we are basically following a very traditional uh, model and have you know it spread across the country. Okay, now let's combine these two things. First, we had this COVID, which just came out of the blue, followed no rules. It created something that we could never have imagined that you could have, uh, impact the whole world and bring it uh, to its uh, knees and destroyed everything in its path, disrupted everything uh, in, in, in its path. Can we learn something from it? Can we understand that a little bit better? Is there something to draw out of this uh, lesson uh, that we have been forced to take as far as the world is concerned in terms of COVID-19 and take that to our higher education system? What, what is it that uh, we can do over here. In that uh, regard, uh, what I would uh, say is that let's look at the possibility of disrupting the world of higher education of uh, Pakistan with the idea that we are going to uh, create a brighter future. Let's just take that thought that uh, uh, if you can have a new disease that can just about you know change everything the way we look at the world and the way we practice the world, why why can't we uh, have at least a mind exercise in looking at what we are doing in higher education? And for that, uh, the uh, proposal is that we challenge everything. Let's challenge everything. So what does that mean? Challenge how we learn. Challenge what we learn. Challenge the language of learning. They say the language is the language in which you dream. Your thoughts, your ideas, your dreams, your feelings. Is that the language we want to learn in or this entity or another language that you know we have chosen English. In this country they use Russian. 
How about challenging the space of learning? Where is learning going to be taking place? Challenging the evidence that learning is taking place. Challenging the assessment mechanisms of learning. Challenging the balance that we have between knowledge and skills and not have a one size fit all solution. Knowledge is important at times, skills are important at, at other times. And it depends upon what you are talking about also. All disciplines are certainly not going to be the same. To do this, we have a phenomenal tool in the form of technology. And we can use and challenge this technology to create virtual uh, spaces. To be language agnostic, to not care. Which language are, are we talking about? The technology can allow us to speak in one language and for you to hear in another language. Technology allows it right now for you to write in one language and for me to read in the same language, in a, in a different language. Technology allows a multiplicity of, of uh, sources, just like we have all of the people here on uh, the video uh, screen from every different part of the world uh, they could be. Knowledge can be streamed from all of the world to come in. Can we think of going beyond testing? What exactly is this test that we are doing and what exactly is it telling us of what has been learned? Can we challenge the thoughts of time and space. Learning has to be done in the morning, 8 to 8.50 a.m. In this classroom, A to one B, or is it uh, something that we can go uh, beyond? And how can we meet the needs of the student, the learner, as opposed to constantly talking about, you know, this is my rigid structure and you meet the needs of this thing. All without compromising quality. Nobody is talking about comp compromising quality. We're just talking about, you know, a disruption that achieves the end, end goal uh, in, a, in, a, in an entirely uh, different way. We challenge what we think about education. Not in terms of, you know, here is a bucket and we fill that bucket. And then when it is filled, we have knowledge, we have education. But in terms of a fire that we create, here is an entity that we light up and we create that passion in that person. And then that fire consumes that and that passion for knowledge is something that goes on lifelong. And we define uh, education uh, differently. So what we need uh, is a disruption in the higher education system in Pakistan that will allow access to everyone, allow access everywhere, allow access at all times without an age limit where we will be able to handle a person who will walk into your office and clearly has the knowledge and the skills required to undertake the course that you are offering, but has no piece of paper that provides proof for that. Provide an education that will be internationally accredited and understood that this is the knowledge that is being uh, imparted and meet colonial protocol framework, whatever international standards we may align ourselves to. will ensure and allow an accumulation of knowledge uh, sources. Khwaja Ghalai, Ulam Farid University wants to offer a course, take it. Sahibal wants to offer a course, another course, take it. National Skills University wants to integrate, provided, of course, that it fits into an overall structure. 
And if one course comes from Coursera, so be it. And a third and another one from edX will allow learning in the language that you are most comfortable with. Why have we not challenged this language issue? We insist on going about talking about every language except the language we actually dream. What power will be released of the imagination of our people if we had the language of learning aligned to the language of their dreams? And we are in a constant process of adaptation, learning from the market and responding to it. This is a utopia. This is uh, uh, something that we don't have, but why can't we aspire uh, uh, to it? What are these rules that we have chained ourselves with? Well, finally, how do we put all of this together? Lot, lots of thought, but you are an individual. How, how does all of this work for you? Well, if you are an instructor and let me speak about something I'm more comfortable with in, in, in technology, let's say that you're teaching uh, a language, a, a computer language, why is it that, that a portion of that course cannot be taken from an open source which has a better way of teaching that, that methodology? Or why can't our math course uh, in which we are teaching, let's say, integration by parts uh, is looking at the Khan Academy and say, well, guys, you know, just go over there and demonstrate that you, are, that you have understood this thing. They're doing a heck of a lot better task because that is an AI driven engine and you'll be able to learn this much better. There's something each one of us who teaches in the and is behind in a classroom can do and you can do it today. And you can take it in a concentric manner, bigger and bigger. You can talk about a whole course. You can talk about your own institution, allowing a multiplicity of, of courses. And then you can band together as universities, as consortia, offer each other these opportunities, bring technology into place, figure out how that one uh, kid who is absolutely brilliant uh, and but speaks uh, Saraiki only, how the heck is that kid going to be educated uh, with you and has only studied up till ninth grade? What, and yet has clearly all the skills that they can take a course in uh, economics. Challenge oneself. One can't be living a, a life in which you are uh, constantly uh, just doing the same thing that somebody else, uh, else has been done. And let's celebrate uh, these uh, disruptions as they occur and share the experiences across the country. And I'm sure that we would be creating a brighter uh, future for the higher education of Pakistan. Thank you very much. What's up? Can I uh, uh, ask a question? I mean, uh, we are seeing at the moment one big challenge in assessment examination. Uh, students earlier were not interested to come online and then now they are uh, interested only for online examination, not on campus. Uh, so, so how you see, I mean, uh, and again, I mean, of course, it's the access, it's the technology you have to blend in. But in all that uh, disruption, faculty and their training is one important element. So how would you respond to that, sir? Well, uh, Fazal, if you recall, at uh, GIK, there was a professor uh, by the name of Dr. Abdullah Sabik. And he challenged, uh, he raised this challenge in that, in that classroom and he said, we are working in the assumption that all uh, these uh, students that we are working with are actually utterly unethical and they will cheat. That's, that's our fear, right? And, and that if we leave them alone, they will cheat. Yet as soon as they graduate, they will work and there will be nobody who will be supervising them at that point in time. So he said, why is it that we cannot raise that inner consciousness of these uh, kids and actually work with them on an honor code? And it worked. 
This was GIK Institute, Topi Swabi, Pakistan. We're not talking about an experiment that, that comes from uh, uh, outside. I myself had many a times uh, uh, done that. Even asked them to take the quiz and wrote the solution on the board and said, grade yourself. And what I found was that they actually were the hardest on themselves. Try this experiment uh, uh, yourself. So the thing is that this is where technology and inner consciousness must meet. This is a, 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 a mix. And that is why probably the consortium of humanities and social sciences is a good medium for that, that we would challenge ourselves. Why don't we talk about building uh, that ability in, in the children and giving them uh, that uh, understanding? And then, of course, you could use technology and AI tools to also form, you know, a general assessment as to what is going on. Dr. Nakwi. Yes, Dr. Nizamuddin Saab. Welcome, sir. <laughs> there, there, I have been in contact with a group in London called fin, FinTech, Financial Technologies Group. They're arguing that Pakistani degrees, or for that matter, many developing degrees are irrelevant anymore. In the, in the modern world, in the Western world. Therefore, we should go for certification programs for special skills which are needed in the market. And there's no more need for BSIT or BS technology, but should go for certification of courses. And therefore, the university should switch or at least add this institute program, certification program. If not, they cannot switch from degrees. They should add the certification program to make their graduates more marketable, more uh, job oriented than they are now? Well, uh, I have two ways of looking at, at this uh, sort of question. In a way, uh, there is certainly an aspect that uh, skills are important. But I feel that the biggest gift that we can do and the bigger uh, for our students and what the gift that we need to give to them is that thirst of learning. Because whatever is being learned today, whatever we are even going to give them as a certificate is going to be uh, obsolete in, in a few years. So what the greatest gift we can give to them is the ability to learn and to constantly evolve and improve themselves. So uh, a certificate uh, and a certification is a shortcut and, an and a fulfillment of an immediate need. That should be there, but that is not the only thing that we are going to be doing. The other way I look at it is that just because we are a developing country, uh, just like COVID-19 didn't treat you know, uh, uh, different people, well, it did actually treat different people differently. In fact, it favored the developing world and it uh, blasted the developed uh, world. But basically, we're uh, just as good as anybody else and we can offer this, uh, the program. And why are you saying Pakistani uh, university degrees are not relevant? What about saying, you know, UK degrees are not relevant? Is it a question of degrees? Or is it a question of a Pakistani degree? Uh, as far as degree education is concerned, uh, I think that it is a constantly evolving tool, but it is definitely the way the world operates at this time. But we should just expand that to include and allow as required the needs for skills and certification to a certain degree. But for a university, it has to be focusing on the ability to learn in the future. Thank you very much. I agree with you. Uh, uh, may I humbly request uh, all the participants to turn their video on so that uh, uh, we can take a one photograph uh, from everybody and then we continue with this session. I will wait for a couple of minutes. And uh, yes, still waiting. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I think, uh, yes.
Some more colleagues are coming. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Sorry, Nakvi Sahib is taking uh, uh, just a minute because we want to uh, remember this day specifically. So, I mean, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we all are uh, one world. So I, let's follow the UNO way. Like uh, we just wave hand and uh, Nakvi Sahib won't be waving because uh, he is our honorable uh, speaker and guest today. And I will take the shot and I cannot wave because I will be just uh, making the screenshots. So please, I mean, if you can wave, everybody. Uh, Thank you. I got one. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, we continue with our question answer session. Uh, so uh, please. Next question. I would uh, like I mean request if the students they get involved, they answer some question. Uh, of course, uh, we are very uh, thankful to all of you. Like I mean, I can see uh, I mean all honorable colleagues with us. Anybody else want have a question, please? Uh, Assalamualaikum, sir. Waalaikumsalam. Welcome, ji. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Professor Dr. Vahid. Thanks uh, for offering us this opportunity. Sir, it's kind of uh, uh, my opinion or suggestion or it's a uh, unique experience during the COVID that uh, this situation is maybe helping universities to identify where our digital learning fits uh, into the education ecosystem that we use the knowledge to transform our teaching and learning in response to the, uh, to the coronavirus. So as you know that we have a long history of operating in environments that are unstable, disruptive, unpredictable. And uh, we have endured the, the political upheavals, financial crisis, disruptive trends, such as the uh, digital transformation and globalization. And we have responded to the demand for the greater access of the lifelong learning and multiple competing demands from the students, society, state, industry, and obviously the local communities also. But sir, the COVID-19 pandemic is unprecedented and is a very formidable challenge. The scope and scale of this uh, challenge have multiple dimensions. In our context, uh, they are interwoven into existing uh, socioeconomic conditions uh, like poverty and deep uh, unsustainable inequalities. Sir, my question is that the pandemic is uh, causing a pass or not? It is uh, disrupting our education or not? Please, sir. Well, um, the immediate answer is yes, it is. it has caused a disruption. But uh, the way we look at it and the way some people view it is that, in fact, uh, what would have occurred perhaps in a decade has occurred in the space of one year. The uh, digital technology was coming in. It was uh, already a part of... Uh, different programs across uh, the world. And we were the ones who were resisting. And uh, we had the ability uh, to work from home, but we were always asking the question, no, 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 the person has to be here. Until we had uh, COVID and then suddenly realized, well, actually life goes on. You know, somebody can be sitting in a rickshaw and uh, answering emails. It, it, it's, it's okay, the work, you know, uh, uh, moves on. So it, it challenged us in very unique uh, manners to look at the way we are doing work and the way we are teaching uh, and recognize, well, actually, you know, all of this technology exists and let's go ahead and use it for our own uh, uh, benefit. So it certainly caused a disruption, but I feel that this disruption has been very positive in, uh, for, uh, for us in the sense of how it has allowed us to operate with freedom, with you know, uh, uh, distance not being a, a, an issue uh, anymore. I mean, uh, we, my children can come and visit me and they are actually still working uh, uh, with their respective jobs somewhere else in the world. And, it did, and you know, all they have to do is to take care of the time difference and the work and the life goes on and we are realizing we can do this also we are realizing that because of technology we can make our lectures so much more interesting we can bring animation in there we can 
uh, uh, add so many sources of information. We can create these, you know, lecture notes with phenomenal hyperlinks, and then we, I can take a portion of Dr. Mukhtar's lecture and put it in, and all of that. So uh, the allowance has been given to us. So it, it, there are, there's a lot of excitement to what can happen here now. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we are sure yes. that our future of the higher education is changing a lot. Oh, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So uh, I think we have to go to South and uh, I, uh, I always miss the voice of uh, my wonderful brother, Khaled Amin Saab, Chancellor. So, sir, do you have a question and then we will come to Rahim Yar Khan. Probably, I think you are uh, muted. Uh, muted, that's it. Yeah. Sir. Yes, sir. We are in Rahim Yar yes. so I think, yeah. Okay. Uh, Khalid Amin sir, we are here. Khalid Amin sir, sir. Ji, bas, I am just listening to you and I am happy to hear you. And please pray for me that I have been saved. Sir, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter, us and several of our friends. Ji, uh, from Rahim Yar Khan, sir. <clears throat> Ji, thank you, Ji. First of all, I want to appreciate the efforts, Professor Dr. Mukhtar Saab, Skilly University, of course, uh, Dr. Sohail Nakvi, and Dr. Fazle Khale Saab, and uh, Murtada Noor Saab. Sir, uh, I agree with the Professor Dr. Uh, Nakvi Saab. We need outcome-based education. We need skilled uh, graduates. Now we are providing the degrees, but we are not providing the skill which is required in the market, which is required by the uh, global market, not only in the Pakistan. Uh, I want one question from Professor Nakwi Saab. Everybody is hurry. Everybody want to be fast. Either it is the lecturer, lab engineer, assistant professor, professor, and then the students ultimately. So nobody is focusing the skill which is required to impart in the graduates. So we are facing the similar problem. One person is assistant professor. He is in a hurry to be associate professor. Then associate, then the professor, but the student uh, students are missing what they are expecting. And we being the management are also in trouble because ultimately global is demanding from us that the, there should be the quality graduate as uh, the Pakistan Engineering Council shifted on outcome-based education. Can we shift the whole university, uh, all the programs on outcome-based? This is my question. Thank you, sir. Well, um, every uh, living thing that is out there uh, is characterized uh, by having a, a biological, biochemical process. But it is also having a spirit or a ruh to it. So I think in the same way, we have to look at our education process also, that there is a... Uh, a, a technical aspect to it, there's a structure to it, but there is a spirit and a ruh to education also. And unless we are focusing in our universities on that aspect also, talking to our assistant professor about why they are uh, there, it's not a, and it's not, it's not the filling of a bucket. You're not there that you're going from assistant to associate because you have ticked four boxes or something like that. And so our educative uh, uh, environment, uh, which requires um, the spirit of thought to be coming out and as manifested by a peer review process. So that's why it is so, that is why in 
universities and education environments, we do not have, and, and, and we have resisted this idea, five papers of 1.2 impact factor plus this, plus this, plus this. This is not a chemical formula that we fill, fill out. So we have to talk about the spirit of education and it has to start with our faculty uh, members so that this spirit of education then be translated into the students who can talk about the spirit of learning and have this fire that they will be keep on, keep on learning uh, throughout uh, their uh, lives. That spirit then manifests itself also and aligns itself very well to an outcome base, which is not looking at now we're looking at what happened and 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 to demonstrate uh, that so that definitely applies that is the modern way to look at things yeah thank you may i ask a question sure go ahead uh, this is idris fajar from pakistan institute of development economics Thank you, Dr. Nafi, for an insightful talk. So how do you look at this uh, ranking thing, especially what uh, Dr. Parvez Hudbai has written about? Now almost 17 universities of Pakistan are in the QS ranking, uh, Times ranking, sorry, and more and more are coming in. So, and these, these rankings are heavily, have a heavy tilt towards research. So my fear is that this would lead to the quantity based, um, there would be more inclination to generate quantity oriented research rather than quality. So how to tackle this problem? First only the researchers were interested in quantity. Now there is a fear that the universities might also be interested in quantity just to get into the ranking. I have another question as well, that how do you look at the online education, the potential of online education in the context of uh, not higher education, but for example, in, in increasing the literacy rate, for example, providing education to the out of school children or for adult literacy. Thank you. Right. So uh, this uh, question of uh, rankings, I have not um, read the article, but I know the thought process that goes behind that. Uh, in general, this uh, discussion and argument about rankings and whether they are good or bad, it is occurring in every education market of the world, in every country, in every region. So it's not something that is peculiar to Pakistan. Second, every one of us, when we are looking at our children and we are saying that somebody wants to study biochemistry or somebody wants to study economics, the first question we will ask is what is their ranking? Now, it is this dichotomy that we have to sort out because everybody uses it and everybody curses it at the same time. So it's, it is a reality. We can marry these realities, as I said before, by integrating the spirit with the practical. The uh, research from Pakistan is coming out, for example, in high quantity, but it is also coming out with high quality. There are bibliometric measures of quality also, but it is not something so simple where you can take one or a few numbers or that. But a primary assumption that some people make that if it is Pakistan, it is going to be bad, that is absolutely ridiculous. We are just as capable of doing good, excellent, superb, and horrible work as anybody else in the world. And rankings is a way in which the world is looking at universities and trying to assess them. And it is mixing both the quantitative as well as the qualitative. So for example, in QS rankings, there is a very heavy component of uh, what do the employers think and what do your peers think? So if it is uh, uh, Saiwal University, we will ask their peers, let's say uh, in um, uh, Sharingal or in Uthal or uh, wherever the case may be, what do you think about 
you know, that university. So there is going to be a qualitative aspect which is covered through by uh, uh, surveys, uh, et cetera. When you combine this information, you get an indication of what the rank of that, you know, how approximately how good it is with a certain bound of error. Now that is, and it's a quite a sophisticated uh, science uh, and these questions have been evolved and debated and discussed and improved and answers improved on over many uh, decades. So you have a fair degree of now comfort that this is a well-ranked university, it is reasonably good. Now, the counter argument that it is given is, but look at this one person that is bad. And that is a ridiculous way of looking at things. When you're looking at statistics, you are looking at averages, you are looking uh, not at individuals. Just because an average of something is very good, it does not mean that every single part of that is going to be very good. So giving a counter argument of one person or two people or one department of that university not doing something well doesn't, doesn't work. So that is the discussion about uh, uh, rankings. Your uh, second issue, which I have now forgotten, can you just remind me that then I'll be able to respond uh, to that. I was saying that how do you look at the potential of online education ah, okay, for yes. furthering okay. the cause of uh, literacy? Right. So uh, I am, uh, being a technologist myself, I am very, very bullish on uh, use of technology. As an example, we have just launched within um, Central Asia and Afghanistan a new program to teach English uh, language. And this program looks at reading, writing, speaking, and comprehension through an app that is driven by an artificial intelligence engine, which means it's entirely computerized and it can deal with a million customers at the same time. This kind of technology and its usage, if it can be done with English, it can be done with Urdu and it can be done with Pashto and whichever language you talk about. In math, we already have uh, examples of uh, uh, Khan Academy and, and the phenomenal work that it, it has done. So technology is most definitely a force multiplier and can do an enormous uh, amount to address our problems of literacy. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I think uh, it's almost uh, 4.01. Uh, Nakvi <laughs> Okay. I think uh, we are about to complete in time. Sorry for one minute extra. I know you have a very busy schedule. Uh, uh, Fazal Khalis, uh, Professor Sab, would you like to say something, sir, before I, uh, what a player. You know, this consortium was started in Punjab and the founding chairperson of Punjab Higher Education Commission and the honorable current chair is with us. So we are really so blessed. And uh, Dr. Nizam Saab, I know you are traveling, but I mean, I really appreciate the passion of all colleagues and we are thankful to everybody uh, being with us today. Gee, sir, uh, would you like to say something, sir? Sir, uh, you have to unmute yourself, sir. Thank you very much. And I think uh, this consortium has uh, really provided us all good opportunity uh, to learn from Dr. Nakwi and uh, certainly the all disruption its benefits and uh, the challenges. And uh, yes, I mean, I think it's going to change uh, like many other things, uh, the, the education sector and particularly higher education sector that they, we are performing uh, in the new normal situation. And of course, the use of uh, technology is going to be one of the most important element along with so many other things. And uh, certainly then uh, with this disruption, uh, we have also come, uh, to, 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 to at par, I would say, in terms of uh, our uh, uh, continuation, uh, online education, digital platform, and of course, uh, the, the new things happening on internet of thing and uh, artificial intelligence, data science. And uh, I'm sure that uh, our universities uh, will then have uh, the opportunity to, to, to also uh, look into the 
uh, suggestions and the thoughts that we have uh, now heard from Professor Nakwi, uh, and then see how best we can uh, move in that direction. And certainly, things are not going to be the same uh, as we talk about uh, before COVID-19. Uh, but it is always a great honor to learn and meet uh, Professor Nakwi. Uh, I missed one mm -hmm. important assignment uh, that he has undertaken as Vice Chancellor Lums, uh, now one of the very fine university uh, in Lahore. And thank you so very much, sir, giving me the opportunity and honor to see and meet all colleagues. Thank you. So this is time to say goodbye, uh, which is not any easier for such a nice uh, gathering and nice questions. So I mean, uh, uh, Mursa Noor, basically, he is the one who is keeping this consortium together. And uh, at this time, he is uh, like uh, his connection by somehow, I mean, this is a typical, like we live in a world where some connection works, some connection doesn't work. So he has a weaker connection. So he want to say also thanks and a gratitude to all of uh, you. And uh, uh, Dr. Kufail, it's a so happiness to see you. So, I mean, all colleagues, uh, honorable students, professors. So, I mean, uh, uh, Professor Nakvi, we love you. Pakistan you. love you always. And uh, we are here to uh, listen to your advices, your support, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, your kindness uh, for being with us for the cause of staying united. And that was the basic aim of Inter-University Consortium, that we all stay united and work together. Thank you all be, uh, Thank for you. being with us, for celebrating the, uh, like the Inter-University Consortium birthday. Happy birthday to Inter-University Consortium. And special thanks to Murtza Noor and all honorable guests for being with us. And of course, I think uh, countless uh, blessing and thanks that uh, we always have uh, Professor Nakhvi